So I'm going to give a, a, a presentation and catch up. Uh, and we're, today we're going to shift over from fintech to venture capital. Quanto saben que es la la, 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 el nombre de venture capital en español. ¿Cómo, cómo se llama venture capital en español? Yo escucho dos nombres. Uno, uno dijo capital emprendedor, otro capital de riesgo. Cuando digo a mis amigos en los Estados Unidos, ellos se dicen, ¿cómo se, cómo, cómo se explica el venture capital en México? Y dije, y digo, bueno, le, le llama capital de riesgo. ¿Y qué significa capital de riesgo? Significa, significa que va a perder todo tu dinero. Tus amigos se van a burlar de ti. Va a tener mucha vergüenza <ríe> si pierdes esto. Y, y por muchos años no se, no se anima, animan el, 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 el ecosistema de emprendimiento en México sobre este asset class, sobre capital emprendedor. Entonces, a capital de riesgo. Entonces, un día nos, nos decimos que vamos a cambiar el nombre. Y hicimos un focus group con estudiantes. Y en este focus group, los estudiantes tenían um, una hora para decidir el nuevo nombre de la industria de venture capital en Latinoamérica. Y un chico le levantó la mano. Entonces, tenemos focus groups y y se juntaron cinco personas en cada grupo para presentar su nombre, para nom nombrar la industria de Venture Capital. Y la primera era un joven dijo, vamos a llamarlo Capital Aventura. Así, así se, se volaron las, las chicas en el cuarto también. Y no, no, eso, es, es, me suena bien, ¿qué, pasa? ¿Qué, qué, ¿qué está mal con esto? Y los hijos, los, los chicos estaban diciendo esto. No, no podemos hacer eso. Así que significa una cosa mala, como tener una, um, bueno. <risa> Entonces, no, no, no escogimos este nombre. Y otro chico dijo, bueno, yo, yo pienso que debemos llamarlo capo emprendedor. Eso suena muy bien, porque estamos enfocados en ayudar a los emprendedores y ayudarles a um, crecer y, y, um, y si está bien ustedes, yo voy a cambiar inglés. Y, y si, no, si no habla inglés, a, atrás um, hay audífonos um, con la traducción. So, and then we're going to start my presentation. So when I, when I decided to shift from um, the, the industry from capital de riesgo to capital emprendedor, this huge shift happened in the marketplace where the market came together and they said, you know what, we, are, we want to help the entrepreneurs. We want to help them create wealth. We want to help them overcome poverty and solve the biggest problems our country is facing. And it's interesting what you focus on, right? If you focus on looking stupid, nobody wants to look stupid. Nobody wants to be seen as taking risks. And so the industry almost didn't exist. Now, I'm not going to say this was the reason the industry took off, but it had a big impact. When we focused on the entrepreneur and built the ecosystem around helping the entrepreneur, who doesn't want to help an entrepreneur? Everybody loves these guys, right? So um, I'm going to take a, a few minutes, and we're going to talk about what it's like to be an entrepreneur, and then we're going to go into a, a panel and talk what it's like to be an, an investor. So you're going to get to see both sides of this. Being an entrepreneur, the highest probability is that you're going to fail. Se van a fracasar. And I'm an expert in failure. Here's a bunch of my failures up on the screen. Now, a lot of people can tell you, oh, I can show you how to be successful. I can tell you how to fail. I'm really good at it. I've invested over $500 million across seven funds, and I have a PhD in failure. Um, now, we've had a few successes, we've sold a few companies, and we've taken a few companies public. But the reality is most startups fail. And they fail for lots of different reasons. We're going to focus on three of the most important reasons that startups fail. Number one, they start a company without knowing exactly 
who their customer is. I told this to my brother, Jason. He said, this reminds me of the Homer Simpson episode when his brother bought, um, he found his long lost brother who owned a car company, PM Motors, and, he, and his brother invited Homer to be the new head of product at PM Motors. Here's the video. Is there, okay, is there sound on it? Are you sure you want to give me a car? Hey, you know what these things cost me? There's maybe 40 bucks worth of steel in them. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I'd like a big one then. We don't have a big one. Why not? Because Americans don't want big cars. Well, then give me one with lots of pep. Sorry, our cars don't have pep. Why not? Uh, because Americans want good mileage, not pep. Homer, <laughs> tell the nice man what country you come from. America. Do you hear that, you morons? This is why we're getting killed in the marketplace. Instead of listening to what people want, you're telling them what they want. Homer, I need your help. You do? Yeah. I want you to help me design a car. A car for all the Homer Simpsons out there. And I want to pay you $200,000 a year. And I want to let you. I want a horn here, here, and here. You can never find a horn when you're mad. And they should all play La Cucaracha. Can do, Mr. S. And sometimes the kids are in the back seat. They're hollering. They're making you nuts. There's got to be something you can do about that. Maybe a built-in video game would keep them entertained? You're fired! What is my brother paying you for? What about a, a separate soundproof bubble dome for the kids with optional restraints and muzzles? Bullseye! And another thing, when I gun the motor, I want people to think the world is coming to an end. Rum, rum, rum! Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed stockholders, members of the press, your holiness, tonight... We are going to witness automotive history. All my life, I have searched for a car that feels a certain way. Powerful like a gorilla, yet soft and yielding like a Nerf ball. Now at last, I have found it. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the car designed for the average man, the Homer. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Homer built a car for himself. How many people are guilty of it? ¿Cuántos emprendedores tenemos aquí? How many entrepreneurs? Okay. Entrepreneurs, former entrepreneurs, have any of you ever built a company without, or technology, with not knowing who the customer is? No, con no confessions? Come on, this is group, ther this is group therapy. We're going to share. Come on, come clean. I've never given a speech where somebody has not confessed. This is not going to be the first one. Any confessions? All right. Have it your way. You're, I was going to give you a prize, too. Um, so Homer built a car with a bubble dome in the back. And, uh, and it, it's for the mother-in-law. Not, not a bad idea, by the way. Um, this was built on a story that actually happened in the United States, the 1958 Ford Edsel. Ford built a car in secret, didn't tell anybody. Ford named it after his son who died, Edsel. So do you think anybody at Ford Motor Company is gonna tell the boss that the car named after his son is ugly? No, it's a beautiful car, sir. They launched in a two-door, four-door coupe, station wagon. They built new dealerships, total secrecy, biggest flop in automotive history. So the Simpsons episode was based on the Ford Edsel. Now, now Ford redeemed itself six years later when it built the single most successful launch in automotive history, the Mustang. Who doesn't want a Mustang, especially a classic 1964 Mustang? What's the difference? When Ford created the Mustang, they brought husband and wife teams into pretend showrooms and interacted with the designs. They focused on the customer. They built something interesting and sexy and priced it right and understood the positioning in the marketplace. So Lee Iacocca led this team. So he went from the worst automotive launch in history to the most successful by becoming customer centric and customer focused. I, I had the same problem, so I'm, I'm going to confess, even though you guys didn't, I will. 
I launched a product back in uh, the 90s. I was a product manager for the first text retrieval engine. It was Google before Google. And I got this a prize from PC Com Computing Magazine, and they said, it's the uh, you know, Innovator Award. I said, oh, so great. And the, the document said I was the mix master, slicer, dicer, Ginsu knife of software products. I had built a product for everybody and nobody. When I went back and looked at it, we had sold into 85 markets across, 25 down, and we weren't establishing critical mass in any marketplace. Instead of building a sleek rocket ship that I was going to leave the atmosphere and, and generate critical mass, I was building something else. Pieces started falling off the company. We got to 200 employees. We couldn't get to profitability because we didn't have a specific customer in mind. We were thinking about, we were coming with the technology to the marketplace. We were not coming with a problem. I fell in love with the product. I didn't fall in love with the problem. Entrepreneurs have to fall in love with your problem and make sure that problem is something in a market that's big enough that, that, that cares about. So every new technology has a first customer and that first customer has a unique problem. So what we're focusing on as entrepreneurs is to build new innovations. Inventions combined with market insight that the customers and the product, want, the market wants to purchase and con consume. And, and as you think about the first new technologies out there, they have a first customer. So for the pager, the first customer, and the, and the mobile phone, the first customer was the doctor. Now everybody has one, but there's an entry point into the marketplace. This idea was pushed by a, uh, an entrepreneur by the name of Jeffrey Moore. He said, when we enter the marketplace, some of us are innovators and early adopters, and we play over here in this early place in the marketplace, and then we come across, there's this chasm with, where most com companies die because they didn't understand the mainstream market problems, and the early majority and late majority, they want comfort. They don't want to take a risk. They want to know that it's safe to purchase, and so the, the importance for, these, for the entrepreneurs is they got to nail what's called the customer and product and market fit. So pick your beachhead. You can't boil the ocean. There's lots of things you can go after as an entrepreneur. N narrow down to the customer product market fit for your first beachhead. Who's your customer? What's the problem that they have? What market are you going after? And make sure your solution is a good fit. And we're going to talk about some ideas to how to help with that. Next way to guarantee failure is to go head to head with an existing competitor that's a gorilla in the marketplace without doing something that's really different. So I'll give you an example of this. There's a company called Path that decided wanted, they wanted to take on Facebook. The problem is Path and Facebook are going after the same customer, you. How many, person, how many people are on Facebook? Want this person that's done on Facebook? It's perfect, right? Everybody, right? To get you to switch off Facebook, I don't have to get you to switch, I have to get you and all of your friends. So really difficult task. Path thought they could do that, and they thought they could, get they could take on Facebook and bring them down. So they built a mobile product that was better than Facebook. Pictures and ad free, and it was an amazing product. They raised tens of millions of dollars. What they found was Facebook was up on that hill shooting down with advantage, and they were able to change and iterate very quickly. So very difficult to take on an entrenched market leader. Uh, and so in Latin America, as we're going into the marketplace, this is an analogy for fintech. A lot of people say, we're going to take on the banks. We're just going to take them down. Mm, probably not. They have entrenched positions, regulatory, you know, it's, it's a well-entrenched marketplace. It might be better to work with the banks, work around the banks, but taking the banks on, um, the head-to-head -head strategy is difficult. And, and with uh, Pan, and, and, and uh, um, Pando Daily said, Path you know, was huge in Indonesia. They found markets that Facebook wasn't. So it's an interesting, unserved markets where Facebook hadn't entered yet, they actually got some, they got some traction. Another way to enter the, strat the market is to create a new category. So like um, the home automation marketplace, years ago, used to be called the thermostat. <laughs> and, and Honeywell owned it for 100 years until a new technology came along called Nest. And Nest switched the behavior of the individual. It was 10 times better. So it is possible, but it's really expensive to take on a market leader unless you have a major disruptive innovation. So another, so let me, let me jump ahead here. 
and go to, if I do want to take on Facebook, how do I do it? Let's go to a place where Facebook isn't. Let's go down to the low end of the marketplace and do something that Facebook is not doing. So when all of you got on Facebook in the United States, when we, all the parents got on Facebook, what happened is all the kids got off because they wanted a private space for, to talk with their friends like we did when, when I was a kid. I had the telephone in the closet away from my family with a really long line. And Facebook um, wasn't, couldn't be everything to everybody, so they left niches and opportunities. So, we, so when Facebook got huge, they created holes at the low end of the marketplace. So Instagram came in, they bought them for a billion dollars, and then this little stupid thing of eight seconds of disappearing text came. What a dumb idea, right? Who would ever use that? Eight seconds of disappearing text, it's ridiculous. So Facebook, originally, the market looks down on these new ideas and says, those are stupid. I would never do that. And then they tried to buy them for three billion and then they went public and who knows what they're worth today, but it's over 15, 20 billion dollars today. So when you come up with a new idea, it's a good practice to, to, to be able to look stupid. So what does a disruptive idea look like? I've got this great idea. I'm gonna let people sleep on my couch. Often disruptive ideas feel ridiculous. Who would ever do that, right? Who would ever rent your couch out to a total slob? So I've got another idea. Let's help people take the bus. Even better, we're getting married. My fiance put all the ideas on the cork board. Let's go take those ideas and let's go put them up on the internet and share them with all of our friends. A more dumb idea I've never heard. Let's talk about the feeling as an entrepreneur, and, and often it's a lonely feeling because you're out there with these ideas that people just don't get. And, and by definition, when you're coming up with a new disruptive idea, the market just says, that's not how we do things here. Especially if you're in a large organization. Banks, the worst. Quantos banqueros tenemos aquí? Can you take a risk inside of a bank? That's, that's the definition of getting fired, right? So how do you go after these new ideas and, and take, take advantage of the disruption while you're working in an organization that says you may not take risks? <laughs> My head exploded. I can't, it's hard to do. It's education. Clayton Christensen calls this the innovator's dilemma. How do you innovate inside of organizations that are not designed to innovate? So this is my Dancing Man video. Here's what it feels like to be an innovator inside of a bank in Peru. I've got this great idea. It's going to be huge. The market is going to flock to me. You trust, trust me, this is going to be the best idea ever. This poor guy is out there dancing in the field. Everybody's making fun of, fun of him, except this guy, the product manager. I'm with you, man. You and me, we're going to figure this market out together. All right, so I'm going to teach you my dance, and then pretty soon the whole world is going to be flocking to us. I got you, man. I'm with you. You guys out there, you don't get it. We get it here. And so he's off in the weeds sometimes. OK, maybe he hasn't figured it out yet. All right, they're in trouble. But they're getting in the groove. OK, we got our, we got our customer product market fit figured out. We know what we're going to build. We just need an engineer to join us. All right, so we have our hacker. We have our visionary CEO. We have our product manager. And we're going to pull this together, and we're going to do our prototype. Music up a little bit, man. We need, some, we need to feel this. Now we need some salespeople. All right. They're going to help us sell and get this in the marketplace. Hey, we got a startup. Woohoo! Let's go raise some seed funding, some angel funding. We look stupid, but we look stupid together. Hey, it's time for a Series A. Let's, let's grow this thing. And you know that you've nailed it. When girls in bikinis start sprinting at you, there you go, you nailed it. <laughs> Pretty soon, everybody on this field is doing the stupid banking dance. <laughs> and after a while, there's over a thousand people that are dancing with this lonely guy out in the field. Being that visionary entrepreneur is so difficult. Being that first person, you have to practice looking stupid. You have to have expert 
be an expert in the, in the art. All right, so this goes on forever, by the way, until everybody in the field is doing the dance. So that couch surfing business, that obviously was Airbnb, over 500,000 listings at Airbnb now. That bus taking business is one of our companies we invested in called Wanderoo, and they won the CES award, and they've been growing hundreds of percent quarter over quarter, helping millennials take the bus. That corkboard business, Pinterest, I hate Pinterest. I still don't get it. The single fastest growing social network on the planet. And, uh, and so it doesn't mean you have to get it to, for it to be a good idea. In fact, you're probably not the customer. The customer is an unloved, underserved customer someplace out in the compo. Somebody else that is not you is gonna be that customer for that new product and service. And you have to remember, I may be the president of the bank, <clears throat> it doesn't mean I have a clue as to what's coming next. In fact, I am most likely blinded because all my people around me are going to tell me exactly what I want to hear. And if the guy that tells me what I don't want to hear, well, he's, he's an ex-employee now. So let's talk about some stupid ideas. Let's go get some loans to laundromats. Okay, that's a bad idea, right? Let's help 20-somethings that don't even have any money manage their money. <laughs> let's help people with bad debt refinance their bad debt. Oh, that's a great idea. I got it, I got it, I got it. Let's go print some new money. Now, a few years ago, these would sound like ridiculous ideas, right? Giving loans to laundromats, that's on deck. Small business loans, over $3 billion in loan note origination growth, and that was two years ago. Refinancing those bad lenders, that's called Lending Club, and uh, they've had some challenges recently, but they've been, they had significant portfolio growth through the roof. That 20-something manage their money, that's another unicorn out there called Wealthfront, helping the millennials, um, robo-advisors manage their money. Printing money, Bitcoin, Ethereum, initial coin offerings, etc. cetera. So what, what felt as like stupid ideas are now taking over because you're going after markets you're not serving today. Do you get the point? Does it make sense? All right. Companies accepting Bitcoin, lots and lots of fintech companies, over a thousand fintech companies, but the question is, have these fintech entrepreneurs nailed it? Most of them know. Third problem for guaranteeing failure is scaling it before you nail it. Poster child for this was WebVan in 2000. They raised over $800 million, didn't have their business model figured out. In fact, 70% of startups fail for this reason, premature scaling doing good things, but doing them out of order. I want to go hire VP of sales, but I haven't finished my product yet. I got my beta ready to launch, but I didn't finish my, my um, alpha. I got my alpha ready to go, but I actually didn't even work on my virtual prototype. Good things in order increase the probability of success. Doing them out of order um, and scaling your business prematurely increases the burn rate and dramatically reduces failure. This was a research that was done in San Francisco by the co-author of my book, uh, Nathan Furr. Cosmo raised $280 million helping, entrepreneur, helping people receive candy bars from convenience stores with no business model around it. So smart people invest into these ideas because they get caught up with, the, with, different, with different things, but there's an there's a order and a process. Small amounts of capital early on testing the ideas, nailing the customer product market fit, getting it right, nailing it, and then scaling it. So I wrote a book on this. You're welcome to buy it. It's on Amazon. <laughs> um, and why nail it and scale it? It's because the model is broken. Often we'll wake up in the middle of the night with this brilliant idea. We'll go tell our friends and family about our brilliant idea. We'll start building our brilliant idea. We go to sell it, and then the market says it's not worth anything. How do, we, how do we fix this broken model? Once you have an idea, I beg you, stop. <laughs> Just stop right there. <laughs> and go and take your idea to the bigideacanvas.com. We have it in English and Spanish. It will help, to help you take your idea from a hypothesis, uh, of, uh, take your idea, create a hypothesis that you can then go into the market and test. It'll help you discover your monetizable pain. What are people willing to pay you for? And why monetizable pain? If you have a problem that people are gonna pay you for, you have a shark bite of a pain that has high frequency, that is the start. 
fall in love with the problem, don't fall in love with your solution. Pain pays, and as an entrepreneur, you don't have reputation, you don't have brand, you have money, but if you can nail a monetizable pain, you can attract angel, angel fund in a sufficiently big market with the right team and other factors, you have a higher probability of raising venture capital. So the end of this idea for nail and scale is, once you have an idea, go talk to your customer and bring them up front in the, pro in the process. Bring them all the way up front and have a conversation with them before you build anything. While it's still, while the cement is still wet, I have an idea, can I have a conversation with you? Often entrepreneurs avoid that conversation at all costs because I'm embarrassed, I don't want to look stupid. Have the conversation early and while you have a PowerPoint presentation, not a product. Well, I like to say, entrepreneur, your role is to innovate, the customers validate. And, and stay away from the Homer model. Um, try, try to remember you're not the customer, the customer's out there. You need to get outside the building. So thank you very much. We're going to now move to the venture capital panel.